Each month, NASM is giving you free courses. That's right, free courses each month just for being part of the NASM family. Learn about everything ranging from nutrition to strength, weight loss to stress relief, and everything in between. Click the link in the bio for information and to claim your free course before they're gone. Hey everyone, welcome to our Strong Mind, Strong Body podcast. I'm your host, Angie Miller, and I have a great guest on today. He is from TRX and NASM and TRX. We do a lot of work together. We play so nice on the playground. And I recently did a podcast for TRX with this gentleman. His name is Zach Van Wagner, and he is the content and curriculum manager for TRX. And before I introduce you to Zach, I'm going to tell you what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about intrinsic motivation, that motivation that comes from within, that deep driving motivation that makes clients want to stick with exercise. It really improves exercise adherence. And we are going to talk about how do we build intrinsic motivation in clients so that we can help them shift the focus from how they look to how they feel. And we can keep them exercising, not just for this week or this month, but for a lifetime. So Zach, come on on and introduce yourself. Thank you so much, Angie. I really appreciate that great introduction. Uh, as Angie said, my name is Zach Man Wagner. I am the content and curriculum manager for TRX training. Uh, I've been doing this role for a couple years now. I've been with TRX for about six years. But before that, I was just another fit fitness professional, personal trainer working out of San Francisco, California. Uh, San Francisco is home to me because I did come here for my undergraduate degree in kinesiology and exercise science from SF State. And once I finished with that, I had already developed and started a career in personal training with uh, Crunch Fitness. And so I just decided to stay and not go back to my hometown in uh, Central California. But I've been in the city for about 14 years, helping people in the community around San Francisco, uh, especially over this last year with everything that's been going on. So. Thank you so much for having me. And once again, thank you for coming on TRX's little little podcast uh, Q&A we did a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, Zach, that's what inspired me to have you on is I thought that you and I just had great dialogue and and uh, we just blended well together. So I was like, Zach, I need to have you on this Strong Mind, Strong Body podcast because you are very much a mind body kind of guy and putting it all together. So let's talk about this whole concept of intrinsic motivation because I think it's a super powerful way. It personalizes exercise to meet our clients' needs. And again, and it really taps into who they are and where they are in their life and how do we keep them coming back to us or back to the gym or just wanting to exercise and stay healthy. And so before we deep dive into that, let's just define the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. To me, intrinsic motivation is um, you know, something that makes me want to exercise because it aligns with my values because it, it it personally attaches to things that are important to me. Whereas extra, extrinsic motivation is more like how we grew up in school where we got a grade. And so we worked really hard because we wanted to get an A or a B, not because we really cared if we learned multiplication tables or did well in math. We just wanted to get the good grade, right? Exactly, 100%, you couldn't have said it better. Uh, you know, intrinsic motivation you said comes from within. It's those reasons deep down that we really want to work out, we want to get fit, we want to get healthy, want to lose weight versus, you know, that just working for the weekend type feeling, right? That I'm going to do this workout, I'm going to get through this set, I'm going to push through this round just so that I can get to be able to have that, you know, adult beverage on the weekend or because I'm going to a birthday party and I want to indulge in some cake. So it's figuring out what is that internal motivation versus just that thing on the outside that you might be working for, you know, week in and week out. 
You know what I was thinking when you were talking about that, I was thinking about a really weird analogy. When my daughter was in college, she used to be a server and she would always kind of like run her, her money the way that I run my gas tank full to empty. <laughs> and so she would do this thing where, you know, whatever she made that night, she'd be like, well, I can spend it because I'll make it again tomorrow night. And that kind of reminds me of what you're saying about exercise, where it's like, well, I'm going to exercise because I want to go to this party tonight or I want to be able to fit into my wedding dress. But it really doesn't tap into why are we exercising versus just going full to empty? You know, I'm going to fill my my uh, caloric bank account with, um, you know, all kinds of exercise so that I can go eat whatever. And that that's just not very sustainable. No, definitely. And I'm sure especially nowadays, everyone's heard the old adage that you can't outwork a bad diet, right? So no matter how hard you work, no matter how long you work out, at the end of the day, we are most likely never going to work out hard enough that's going to offset all those nights or all those afternoons or all those evenings of whatever it is that we're intaking without a little bit of, you know, checks and balance, right? It doesn't have to always be about eating. It could be about anything else, right? It could be you were saying trying to fit into something and maybe you're overworking yourself when it comes to cardio, you're overworking out, right? You're just like, I got to get there. I got to get there. I got to get there versus stopping and even just looking at what it is you're doing and maybe making a better plan of action that also involves rest and recovery. Uh, is one of the biggest things, right? We know that, you know, we all want to get those gains we talk about in the gym, but the unfortunate truth for some or the fortunate truth for others is that all those results happen when we're actually not in the gym. All the things we do in between the hours of working out and pushing ourselves either by ourselves or with the coaches or with our community that we do end up um, doing those training sessions with. Yeah, absolutely. And I love the checks and balances because I find that checks and balances often comes as we age too. Um, so, you know, a lot of times it's the stuff that we can see. It's what's going on with our heart. It's what's going on with our brain. There's always going to be checks and balances, like you said, for lack of exercise or a poor diet. But, you know, one thing I want to say, one last thing I want to say about intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation before we even kind of deep dive into how we start to build it is that intrinsic motivation is highly linked to self-determination theory. And most of us remember self-determination theory if we've taken any kind of psychology class or if you've gone through your NASM CPT course, they talk about this in terms of motivation. But self-determination theory is that people are more motivated, motivated to change when they feel competent. So they feel like they're actually capable of achieving the task at hand. And when they, too, they feel a sense of belonging. So they feel like they, um, they, they belong to the, the gym, the organization, with you, whether it's in a group, TRX does a lot of group training, NASM, we teach about group training. And then three, a sense of autonomy. They have to feel like they have personal control over their actions and decisions. So I think that the more that we foster autonomy in our clients, we don't just tell them what to do, do this, do this, do this. And the more they feel like they have a say or some play in the game, the more motivated they are to keep wanting to come back. So I just wanted to kind of throw that in there to give better context to intrinsic motivation. Yeah, and I love that. You know, one of the things that, you know, whether it's a good or a bad thing, when I took away from, you know, my higher learning in college, right, it's, you spend all this time learning about formulas and, and just to take that test at the end. But the one thing that we can always remember is that those books are never going away. We always have the capability to coming back and looking at those books again those formulas, especially nowadays when you have a cell phone, which is basically a small computer in your hand, if there's something that you forgot that you learned, even a week ago, a month ago, two, three, five years ago, you can always go back and look that up. So, you know, I don't remember the exact theory you were talking about, but everything that you just laid out are the things that I do with my clients, right? We teach them about why they're doing something. We give them the skills and the knowledge so that they can achieve it. And along the way, we're trying to hopefully as coaches foster a sense of belonging community, not only with you and your client or clients if you're doing a small group, but any classes you're taking, any communities that you might be involved in. So even if you have, if you're listening to this for the first time, you've never heard that actual theory written out before, but you find that you are doing those things, you know, that's something that a lot of good trainers do. If you have those instincts to want to do better, 
you have those instincts to want to help the people in front of you, you often will do a lot of the things that the textbooks say to do, even if you're not actually, you know, going by the textbook. Um, but having the knowledge to actually do it when you actually read the textbook and it lays everything out for you step by step, that's something that they can just make it smoother. Maybe you're just doing one thing out of order, where if you switch the order of something, all of a sudden, the efficacy of the client or the efficacy of your program and the adherence of your program skyrocket. So I, I, I love the call out on that. It was great. Okay, perfect. Well, and I, I love the way that you described that because it's true. We don't have to follow the textbook, but the textbook is a good guide. And sometimes just knowing about a theory and going, yeah, I do that. I actually do that. I just don't have that name for it. But Zach, when you and I were talking about building intrinsic motivation, you said that you felt like, you know, obviously it all starts with that intake. And you had some great ideas on how you do an intake with your clients in order to kind of start to foster that intrinsic motivation. So let's talk about that. What do you do Definitely. during that initial intake? So the initial intake for me, that, that, that's, you know, you can think of it like an interview, you can think about it as a first date, um, but just depending on the way that your psychology works, right? A lot of people are terrified of a first date. A lot of people might be terrified of an interview situation. I just really look at it as the chance to do your best job as the coach or as the trainer for that client. Because at that moment, you are having that first maybe interaction where you're sitting with them, maybe virtually or in person. And the biggest thing, the best thing that I believe you can do is actually be genuine and wanting to help that person. And sometimes that comes with asking tough questions. And the more comfortable you are with answering those types of questions, the more comfortable you'll be with asking those to somebody else. For example, one of the things that kind of that always locks up is you know, talk to me about your nutrition. I usually don't like to use the word diet because diet has a negative connotation for a lot of folks, especially people who might have gone through eating disorders or might not have a healthy relationship with food. And I truly believe that words matter. How you talk to somebody, the tone, the actual, you know, the, the verbiage you're using can make a difference. And I'm not saying that because you have to make sure every single word is right. But it's more so in like if you write out your questions that you want to ask and you read them back as if you were asking yourself, you know, are you saying it in a way that you think is going to foster a relationship or are you maybe saying it in a way that, you know, you would just write down in personal, in personal, like intake sheet. So that's the big difference, I believe, when it comes to in-person contact is that so much is done behind an algorithm. So much is done behind a Google form. And I'm not saying that those things aren't useful, but what is more useful is the actual conversation with the person and then taking those notes to see what it is you can really do to help them. So the first and foremost thing is write out your questions, read them back to yourself as if a person was asking you and seeing is this, is this the information that I want to get or are these a little too surface level? And if they are too surface level, what's one or two kind of leading questions that you can then ask to get the information you're looking for. You know what, I absolutely love that. Read the questions aloud to yourself and ask yourself, how would you perceive that if that were being asked to you? And by the way, I am talking to Zach Van Wagener. He is a content and curriculum manager at TRX and we are talking about intrinsic motivation and how do we build intrinsic motivation in our clients. And Zach just had a superb idea. He talked about asking questions. And you know, Zach, that's one of the things that I really liked about you and you and I had our session is we're both a deep dive into a person's kind of psyche and trying to get inside and figure out where are they and what can I do to bring them along on this journey and kind of guide them and collaborate with them, not boss them around and tell them what to do. And when you were just talking, it reminded me of what I talk about in motivational interviewing, which is to use ORs, which is those open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, and summaries. And in motivational interviewing, questions are where it's at. Instead of asking yes or no questions or, you know, what do you eat? Or you, you said yourself, tell me about your nutrition. And that's one of the things that I encourage trainers to do is start with things like tell me about or um, what or when or how. So another example would be um, 
what can you tell me about your nutrition or your exercise routine? Or can you think of a time in your life where you exercise? What were you doing and what motivated you then? Or maybe moving into the future, if you were to start exercising, what do you think would be different about your life? And so talking about either forecasting or talking about the past, but using those open-ended questions that invite clients to tell us their story. A hundred percent. I love that. And I, I, I even have questions like that in my intake forms where, you know, I get into a lot of what they're currently doing. Like that, that's just important, right? One of their history, what they're currently doing. Um, and then I want to know what's worked in the past, you know, based on the goal you have, has there ever been a time that you actually achieved this goal? And if you have achieved it, what helps you get there? On the backside of that, if you've had this goal for X amount of time and you've never achieved it, what are the things that you think that have been keeping you from there? Because as exercise coaches, as fitness professionals, as personal trainers, however you want to label yourself, we probably have a full toolbox of the ways we can help the person in front of them. But if your number one go-to thing is I'm going to set up this person for every workout and make sure they know exactly what to do and make sure they're motivated to do that, well, if they already are motivated to do that, are you actually helping them? Because like, that's how I see myself is I, you don't need to motivate me to get the work done inside the studio. Like you give me the workout, I'm going to crush that thing every time. Because to me, that's the easy part. The easy part showing up, grabbing weights, grabbing bands, grabbing whatever it is I'm going to use and getting every set, every rep, taking the rest periods and pushing it. But what I know personally is my problem is nutrition adherence. I just get to a certain point where I'm just like, you know what? I'm just going to eat what I want to eat. And I, I know enough about it to get, you know, where I want to get to, but I don't know enough. And that's where my weakest point was. So I hired a coach to teach me what to do. And really the thing he's going to, he's helped me to do it the most is just be honest about what I'm doing. He holds me accountable. And sometimes that's all we need is someone just to hold us accountable. But if that's the one thing someone needs, then all you have to do is check in with them. Right. But if they need hand holding when it comes to their nutrition because they have no idea what to eat or they need the help with their sets and their reps, well, then that's where you put that effort forth. So just mm -hmm. having those questions is important for the coach to know how they can help the person the most right then and there. I love that. And I think also in doing that, then you know um, where you might need to collaborate with someone else. If your strong suit isn't nutrition and your client lacks in nutrition, you don't have to fake it and, and pretend like you know everything about nutrition because you're afraid your client might leave you. Instead, you can collaborate with somebody who specializes in nutrition and really work with your client to go that extra mile. But you're spot on, Zach. It's asking those questions initially. If we didn't ask those questions, we wouldn't know where those barriers are. And that was one of the things too, that I think that when we're doing that intake, we have to tap into their perceived barriers. And then we have to find out what, where do they perceive um, them running into problems? And you even asked that, like in the past, when you exercise, what worked, what didn't work. And so where do they perceive their barriers are? And a lot of times clients will say energy. I don't feel like I have the energy. And we know that a lot of times that it's about emotional energy versus physical energy, because we all feel exhausted by the end of the day. They might say time. And for some clients, you know, if they're a single parent and they've got three kids, time really is a serious thing. And so we have to help them with time management and give them shorter workouts or whatever it might be. But I think it really helps to listen to what clients perceived barriers are. So we have a deep understanding of what they see that's getting in their way. A hundred percent. Couldn't, couldn't agree with you more. And again, it just starts with those questions and there's nothing to say. You can't rework the questions. Um, almost every time I bring in a new client, I read it back over and say, could this question go here? Can I add a question? Do I need to eliminate a question? Um, so just like anything, like you're never going to stop adjusting. And as soon as you think you figured it out, my suggestion is to go back within three to six months and see if there's something else you can readjust just like anything else. 
Yep. So, you know, Zach, I'm curious about something. One of the things that I talk about in motivational interview is called a writing reflex. And often it happens the minute we get into that intake interview with our clients, we hear everything that's wrong, right? We're like, oh, I can't wait to fix them. Like putting together a big puzzle. Ooh, I know where the missing pieces are. We just can't wait to just finish that thousand piece puzzle. And so we go right in like, shh. Like, you know, the trainer superhero. And we're like, I got this. Don't you worry. And that writing reflex makes us kind of want to go in and tell them what to do. And I don't know about you, but what do people most hate? <laughs> um, and just off the cuff, people probably hate being told what to do. Like, yeah, thank <laughs> what micro Micromanage at least, right? People hate being micromanaged. Yeah. They don't like being told what to do. So I think it's better. It's it's what you're saying is these questions are really about evoking. I call it evoking or going fishing. I want to fish out what motivates you. What are your perceived barriers? Tell me about a time when you used exercise. Tell me what got in your way. Um, tell me about how you'll feel if you start exercising. All these different questions that just evoke information. And so not getting into that writing reflex where we want to fix them, but instead talking to them about how we're going to be a collaborator. Like you and I are going to start dating and our dating is going to be us working together as a trainer client relationship. <laughs> exactly. A hundred percent. Right. And that goes back to asking them the right questions and them figuring out, okay, this is what, you know, held me off the last time. This is what worked the last time. Uh, and just like in, in, you know, any collaboration, right? We want to play to people's strengths and help build back up their weaknesses. And in this case, the weakness, they're just barriers, right? And so it's giving them and arming them with the right information to help overcome those barriers. Yeah. So I'm talking with Zach Van Wagner. He is the content and curriculum manager at TRX. And we are talking about intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation and how do we build intrinsic motivation in our clients. And Zach, one of the things, you know, we've, we've talked about now doing that intake session, we've talked about the value of questions and using ORs from motivational interviewing, those open-ended um, affirmations, reflections, and summary questions, questions that aren't simple yes or no. And then we've talked about tapping into their barriers. So another thing that you and I talked about, and you had some great ideas on, one thing that really helps to build intrinsic motivation is arming our clients with useful information. So being like this vast, vast bank of knowledge and arming them with useful information. So give me some ideas how you arm your clients. Great, so going back to the concept of like intrinsic, right, and asking them questions, the big thing is not writing all the wrongs, but taking notes of the things that they need help with. And then as you make that list, once you're done with the intake, once you know what their goals are, what are the one, two, or maybe three things that you can give your clients or your group to do that's gonna make the biggest difference? I typically will never give a client more than three things. Actually, I'm afraid that I never give a client more than three things. Most of the time I try to just stick with two. And Going you're talking back, about, you're talking about between each session, right? Just to clarify. Uh, I'm talking about in general. So let's say okay. like I give them one, two or three things to work on. And until those one, two or three things have consistently been mastered, we don't work on anything else mm -hmm. because, and that doesn't include workouts, right? So if I'm training a client, let's say twice a week, but they need to do at least three to four you know, workouts or training sessions a week, well, they're, they're other two on their own, like that's table stakes. Like you have to get that done. So that's automatically number one. However, all of the little things, right? Because again, if we talk about our, our clients, that one hour, maybe the 20 minutes, maybe the 30 minutes, that's where we stimulate change. If we talk about, you know, getting tone, getting stronger, losing weight, whatever it is that you want to get better at, the 20 to 60 minutes that you're working, that's where we stimulate change. But the change actually happens in the other 23.5 hours during the day. So if we take the concept of energy, you know, I just don't have a lot of energy. I want to make sure that I, I'm able to, you know, keep up with my kids or keep up with the demands of my work or keep up with whatever it is I'm trying to keep up with. 
then we intake what they've been doing. So let's say that they're not drinking water and they're not sleeping at least seven hours a week. Well, those are the two things we're going to work on because as we know, the more hydrated, the, the more hydrated we are, the more our body can move fluids around. The more hydrated we are, the more oxygen we have in our blood. And then the more we sleep, the more energy we have, the better recovery we get. So the more energy we can push forth the next day. So that's a kind of an example of what I'm talking about. What's the one, maybe two things, if we believe our clients can handle a third thing on top of everything else they're already doing, that we can give them that third thing. But typically that third thing is going to be their homework, which is either going to be the stretching and mobility I've been giving them, or it's going to be the actual workouts that I've programmed for them to take home with them. Um, by doing that. that, you're building those habits, right? You're slowly building those habits. Example I always use because for whatever reason, people don't like to drink water or people just don't notice they don't drink it. And I give that to almost every single client. You know, you're drinking this amount. We want to get you to half your body weight in ounces. So if you weigh 120 pounds, you need no matter what to be drinking at least 60 ounces of water. 120 cut in half to 60. We just changed that to ounces. Now we have that. Um, but you know, and that's if you're not working out, that's if you got up, went to your computer, zoomed, went to the kitchen, went back. So just as that one example, but once they've shown me that they can increase their water, now they've built that habit. Now they know they're capable of doing that. And I can either just increase their water or I can give them something else to work on. Mm -hmm. All of this building up that, that intrinsic motivation, because they're the ones that are doing it. I'm just suggesting it. And then I'm just holding them accountable to doing it. I'm not actually doing any of the work, which is the great part when you show them that. Yeah. And I think that it is important to only get them one or two things, wait till they successfully achieve those things. I also love the way that basically what you're saying is during that interview, if I said my perceived barrier was lack of energy, instead of trying to fix the fact that I don't have energy or tell me why I should have more energy or call me out on it, you're basically asking me a simple question like, hey, I'm wondering how much water you're drinking a day. Do you think we could make it a goal to add in X amount? of water because you know what it, it's actually supported that you're going to have more energy if you drink more water or or you know you're going to feel better and hey how's your sleep just asking me questions and then giving me a correlation between what i said my perceived barrier was and then how i might be able to implement things into my life but the biggest thing that i hear here is you're telling me what to add instead of what to take away. See, that's the other thing about, you know, motivational interviewing in general and, mo and building intrinsic motivation is we're always telling people what to take away, but, but we forget to tell them, we forget to reverse that and talk about what to add. Instead of saying to me, you need to stop eating this or that. How about you need to start, you could start eating this or that, right? So let's talk about what I can add instead of what I need to get rid of. 100%, right? And, and that's part of giving them useful information. Because as you just said, if I'm just telling them what not to do, or what to take away, then their focus is going to be on that thing. And if we think about the concept of uh, the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, the concept of just envisioning things and speaking things into existence, right? The thing that we think about, um, like Simon Sinek, he does a, he does a, a joke or does a thing where he's like, I'm going to prove to you that the human mind can't not think about something. And he comes on, he says like, don't think about a pink elephant. And the only thing you can think about is a pink elephant. Mm -hmm. If I tell somebody, don't eat pizza. If I tell somebody, don't drink as much alcohol, right? That that's what their focus is on. But if I give them, Hey, I want you to drink this much water. I want you to make sure you have two to three servings of fruit every day. I want you to make sure you have, you know, a serving of vegetables with as many meals as possible. Now that's what they're focusing on. So at the end of the day, ideally they're hydrated, they're more full because the fibrous foods they've been eating and they have more energy because they're not consuming things that actually cause a negative energy effect. And so by and by all of this useful information that I just gave them is pushing them closer and closer to the goals they're getting after. And again, I'm giving them the information, but I'm not making them do it. I'm simply asking them, hey, how are you working out on this? How are you working on that? And then we have other strategies, right? If they're not doing those things, then it's like, okay, here's what we're gonna do instead, 
right? And then you just kind of keep going along this pathway of here's the thing to work on. Did you do it? Yes, no, why? Okay, let's make it a strategy about how we can either get better or move to the next step. But all of that is encompassed in that useful information. And let's be honest with between NASM, TRX and all the other places out there, there's plenty of useful information we can take in to then give it to our clients to actually make them successful. Yeah, I, I think that what you just said, those past couple of minutes, synopsize is like the perfect way to describe. Because if you just tell me not to eat pizza, you're right. That's exactly what I'm going to think about. And that's exactly what the human mind thinks about. If I say, Angie, don't eat chocolate, that's all I want to think about. But if I'm thinking about everything you told me to add into my life, then that's at the forefront of my mind. And once I add all those things, it takes away the urge to have the other things that I really don't need to have anyway. So I love that. One of the things, Zach, that you also mentioned, you talked about NEAT, explaining the concept of NEAT. What did you mean by that? So NEAT, N-E-A-T, non-exercise active thermogenesis, which is just a long fancy speak for all the energy you're burning when you're not actually working out. So for example, right now I'm standing up doing this podcast with you versus sitting down. Standing up takes more energy than sitting, so I'm burning a little bit more calories. Now, is it going to be, you know, 100 more calories than sitting down? Not for this hour, but if you compound this over the days, over the weeks, over the months, now we're talking about a significant amount of energy, right? Those of you that might live in an apartment building that has an elevator, maybe instead of taking the elevator every day or the escalator when you get to work, you decide to take the stairs, right? Let's you know, maybe if you work on the 20th floor, maybe you take the stairs as long as you can. And then you pop on the elevator when you can't walk up anymore, building that up constantly. Uh, if you know, you go to the, the shopping mall or you go to the store, maybe you park in the middle of the parking lot instead of the closest space you can. Maybe you work that into the end, right? And these are things that you can add in if you're noticing that your workouts and the energy you're expending just isn't quite getting you there. Or if you're not ready for full workout, here's things you can add in before you get there. So standing up for 30 minutes, right? Setting an alarm on your phone, super easy. It's just, are you willing to do these things to get your neat calories up? And this could be, you know, an extra one to 300 calories a day. You know, you take that over the course of a week, you're now down 700 to 2,100 calories more. You know, they say 3,500, you know, calories equals one pound of fat. So if you're doing this over the course of the week, you're now almost burning an extra pound of fat every week for those people who are looking for that type of, uh, that type of goal. Or if you're just looking to increase your energy expenditure because it's summertime and you go on more hikes, you go on, you know, you go camping where you like to float down the river, any type of, again, I'm you're probably using California type examples right now. But anything, right? It could be up, up to anything. So increasing heat, all meat is is the energy you're burning when you're not actually working out, standing, walking longer, taking the stairs versus the elevator, um, you know, going on calls. So one thing that, you know, we're all behind this computer right here, obviously I need to be facing forward, but if you have the opportunity to take phone calls where you can walk around, even if you're just walking around your block, take that phone call from there. Again, walking is a great thing in general. People sleep on walking a lot, meaning that people think that if they can't do a hard workout and they only have 20 minutes, that why do anything? I promise you, if you turn that 20 minutes, 10 minutes, five minutes into a walk, that'll start to snowball. You'll feel better. Your energy will increase. And who knows, that could turn into a jog, a run, or an actual 20-minute lift. I'm one of those people who didn't use to actually think that if I didn't have at least 45 minutes to a workout, like what's the big deal? And I changed that because I got so busy that I was like, you know, what? I'm going to do something for 20 minutes. And that got me motivated to do more and more things for 20 minutes. And I just built up a bunch of 20 minute uh, programs. And now I use some of those programs in some of my classes. So it yeah. could also just snowball into things like that. So that's what neat is in a nutshell. Yep. And I'm so glad that you explained it. I wanted to pass that off to you because I was like, I'm going to give it to you because you're going to give us the short and sweet version and I'm going to give us the longer than necessary version. So thank you so much. That was absolutely perfect. And that's the thing. I mean, it's all these things that we can be doing throughout the day that add up by the end of the week. Sure, maybe it's not going to make a huge difference, but all the time when I'm when I take phone calls now, I put in my AirPods and walk on my treadmill. Drives my sisters and my friends nuts, but I'm like, you know what? 
I have to be doing something. And I'm sorry if you have to listen to my treadmill. It's either that or I walk outside and then, you know, I, I walk a puppy who's always talking to other puppies and there's a lot of noise there. But there's all these little incidental things that we can do. We can, that's why I encourage clients to wear those trackers is because every hour in the hour, this thing is going to buzz and it's going to encourage you to get up and do something. And all of that adds up over time. I think that people really, that's why I call it movement, not exercise. Because it's just all the different ways that you can move throughout the day that make the biggest difference, right? That's why they say that you can't exercise one hour a day and sit for the other hours and expect that to be enough. A hundred percent, right? A hundred percent. And, you know, don't get, don't get her wrong. Don't get me wrong. Like there are times when you are exercising, like you step onto the gym floor and you are there to exercise. Right. But one of the things that I learned early in my career is not everybody likes to exercise. Like, there are some people when I first started, you know, if people sit down in the gym. The only reason they're sitting in front of you as a trainer is because the gym gave them a free personal training session. And one of the very first things out of their mouth is like, I'm only here because you guys gave me a free session. Or I'm only here because I know that I need to be here, but I hate working out and I hate exercising. Those used to be like, those were soul sucking. Because here's me, 20 years old, 21 years old, like, Let's work out. Oh my God, we're going to do bench press. We're going to do squats. We're going to use dumbbells. We're going to use bands. It's going to be so great. Yeah. The very first thing, I hate working out just with yeah. this space. So yeah. we as coaches, like we have to meet people where, where they're at. And if we have more tools in our toolbox to do that, cool. You don't like to exercise. We won't exercise a day in here. What do you like to do? Right. And that starts the conversation of, I like to play this sport. I used to do this. I used to do that. Right. And then there's a little bit of onus on us to make things more fun and interesting. That's a whole nother topic and a whole nother podcast. Right. Uh, right. But the biggest thing is just how can we get people like you said to move? It doesn't have to be exercise. It can be movement. It can be, you know, playing game with a medicine ball or a tennis ball or a softball. You know, some a good warm up that I used to do in, in the this, this summer would be take my clients out that enjoyed playing baseball or football. We would just throw the ball around for a while. I'd make them move around a little bit, but after 10 minutes, they were A, having fun, and B, they were sweating, ready to go work out back inside. So yeah. all of these things are definitely good strategies. You know what? And so I want to reintroduce you, Zach. I'm talking to Zach Van Wagener, and he is the content and curriculum manager for TRX. And at NASM and TRX, we do a lot of work together. And Zach and I are talking about building intrinsic motivation and how we do that in clients. We've talked about the power of an interview with our clients and initial assessment and how skills from motivational interviewing come into play using the oars. We've also talked about other things like asking all these open-ended questions and, you know, all these other ways that we build intrinsic motivation. And basically it's about getting to know our clients, meeting them where they're at, listening to their perceived barriers, and then helping to give them tools or one to two things to work on that they can feel successful and that help them overcome their barriers without telling them what to do, but actually giving them guidance and collaborating with them. And you know, Zach, one last thing that I want to talk about before we go is you talked about checking back in with your clients. And one thing that I think is really important here is to remember that when it comes to motivation, motivations change over time. And what motivated me to exercise when I was 20 does not motivate me to exercise now. And so motivations change over time and we constantly have to check back in with our clients, see where they're at, see what's going on in their lives. Again, evoking that information from them and then finding out what's going to motivate them most right now. What do you think? I could not agree more with that as well. Um, biggest thing, right, is motivation change. When someone comes to you with the very first time they train with you and what might happen three or six, 12 months down the line, that's going to adjust, right? Sometimes it adjusts with the seasons. You know, maybe they come to you in wintertime where they're not going anywhere. They're stuck inside their apartment, their house, whatever it is. But then summertime, they like to go surfing or they like to go play water sports or they go hiking or they take a trip somewhere where they're backpacking, something. It doesn't really matter what it is, but what they might come to you for in January, the beginning of the year might change in July. Um, hopefully you have more check-ins more than that six month mark, but checking in just allows you to adjust for your clients. It also allows you to reel them back in on the other side of the coin, right? Because if somebody every month has a brand new goal or something they wanna work towards, 
Well, that's not as good because as we know as coaches, adaptation is the key to everything. If we keep changing things before we actually see an adaptation, well, then we're not really getting any better. Like muscle confusion and all that's good, but you have to make the muscle actually understand what's happening first, the system, the body, whatever it is that you're looking for, it has to adapt it first a little bit to see the gains, to see the motor control, to see what we're looking for, and then we can adjust it. So checking in doesn't have to be, or it shouldn't be a bad thing. It should be, how are you feeling with this? Are you being challenged by the exercise and workouts I'm giving you? Do you feel that we're getting towards the goals that you're working towards? Because it's not always about aesthetic, right? If you have body fat, a scale, and you're taking progress pics, well, you can see if there's changes happening there, right? If you're taking notes and clients are going up in weights, they're, you know, holding positions or they're, you know, going longer in endurance, then you're also seeing actual data that's giving them that. So as long as you're keeping a track of what's happening, then you kind of know that progress is going on. But, you know, some, that might not be what the client wants to do. And ultimately, you are being hired by your client to get them somewhere that they want to get to. And as long as you and the client are having a good time, there's no, you know, butting of heads, there's no like fighting or any disagreements going on, then it's who of you as the, as the trainer, as the coach, you know, to check in every, I would say every month to six weeks. How are you feeling? Is everything going the way you think it should be going? Are there things that you think we should change? Not to say that you're giving them full control of the program, because again, they hired you. And so you should be giving them recommendations. However, if the recommendations aren't leading to adherence, then you're kind of just going around in a circle, right? And we as coaches want our clients to succeed just as much as they want to succeed, sometimes maybe more, maybe to a fault at times, maybe not to a fault at times. But, you know, checking in should never be something that we fear. And I think that as a younger trainer, if our clients aren't getting the goals that they should be getting, there's a fear that, well, they're going to stop hiring us or they're going to stop paying us. But we also have to understand that, you know, you're not going to get every client to their goal. Yes, that's, that is the goal and that's our job. But sometimes people come to you with a, with a goal that you, they sold you on. And by the time they realize it, they're like, you know what? I kind of just like to work out. I don't really have a goal. I just want to, you know, I know how to work out now. You've taught me enough that I am going to go off on my own and figure it out because I don't have anything to work on. And so the juice isn't worth the squeeze. But that's a very small fraction of the time. Right. Typically, if you ask your clients what it is they want to achieve and you're constantly checking in with them, they are going to get better. It's going to make you a better trainer, you a better coach, and it's going to just build that skill set of being able to talk to your clients on and get real and have that personal touch into it because we're personal trainers. We're not just trainers. People often make the joke, trainers are for horses. Maybe, but they're not called personal trainers for horses. And so, you know, people kind of make that joke. It's like, I'm a coach, I'm a coach. It's like, you're a coach and you're a personal trainer. But the personal yeah. thing is what we really need to lean in on. And that's what it comes about checking in, checking in on people, how they're doing personally, not just as a, another sheet in your, in your day. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think that all that was well said. And I think that too, when you're checking in with people, I like to ask questions like, um, what type of positive impact has exercise had on your life? How has it influenced your relationships? How has it influenced your sleep? How has it influenced your emotional health? Do you feel more positive? Do you feel like you're waking up with more energy? So I like to ask them questions that have nothing to do with weight on a scale or, or anything else that just talks about the influence influence of exercise on their lifestyle, their energy level, their relationships, and all those personal things. And so I think that that's where checking in is is very powerful too, is making exercise about, again, personalizing it to them, to what's important to their value system, which is dependent on what they tell you, what kind of job they have, what type of relationships they have. So again, I was talking with Zach Van Wagner, the content and curriculum manager of TRX, and we were talking about intrinsic motivation. And we talked about the power of an interview. We talked about arming clients with useful information. We talked about giving them things to work on between our workouts and giving them goals. And then we talked about checking back in. So I thank all of you for joining us. Zach Van Wagner, I thank you so much for being on the show and sharing your insights about building intrinsic motivation with clients. And um, do you have any last words, Zach? Or are we good? 
I think we're good. Thank you for, you know, tuning in. Thank you for listening to my, my intake on it. Uh, you know, you can find me at all the TRX social channels. Uh, and if you're uh, interested, the TRX core is now live and we have a lot of information just like this for you to completely peruse, intake, study, and then go back out there and have some fun with your clients and with your classes. So I look forward to seeing you again. Um, if you get, if you guys are out there, tune in and hopefully I'll see you guys soon. All right. Thanks again, Zach. Okay. Thank you so much to our NASM audience for joining us. We can't wait to see you next time.